Hey everybody, welcome back to The Historian's Craft. In this video, we're going to be talking a little bit about this book, uh, Japan 1941 Countdown to Infamy by Eri Hota, or I guess technically Hota Eri would probably be more correct because she's Japanese. Um, anyway, based on the title, you can probably figure out that this book deals with Imperial Japan and the countdown uh, to Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. So, I don't know about other countries, but in mine, in the States, um, World War II is often remembered as the good war, right? It's, this is a war that, unlike so many other wars, wasn't necessarily fought for uh, territorial expansion or some kind of national gain. This is a conflict which went out and, through military force, solved the problem. World War II has a, or had, rather, uh, a very clearly defined set of bad guys, right? Fascist Italy, Nazi Germany, uh, and then in this case, the Japanese colonial empire and the militaristic expansionist uh, Japanese states. Between 1937 and 1940, roughly, so about three and a half, maybe four years, Japan, via war um, and really aggressive diplomacy, expands its territorial holdings in East Asia. It moves out from um, colonies it already had in Taiwan, in Korea, in the South Pacific Islands, what were known um, in the Japanese terminology of the empire as Nanyo, the Southern Island colonies, and it expands, primarily moving into China uh, via you know land invasions and naval invasions, and through its colonies of Manchukuo and, again, Korea, and to an extent, uh, this little tiny enclave of Mongolian quasi-vassals. Mengchukuo was a weird state. Uh, anyway, this is a period of colonization during which basically everybody in the Japanese Empire suffered horribly, especially the Koreans. But, in 1941, as if this island nation didn't already have enough on its plate, they're trying to devour China, the Japanese decide to add more chaos into the mix. And on December 7th, 1941, the American naval base at Pearl Harbor uh, in Hawaii was attacked, it was bombed, and it draws the U.S. into what eventually becomes the Second World War. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that if you're an American like me, um, or British, or, well, maybe not French, depends on your point of view there, um, but definitely if you're American or British, it's easy to view this as the good war, right? There's a very clearly defined bad guy, there's a very clearly defined um, set of objectives. Nazi Germany, Italy, the Germans were orchestrating a certain horrific event I can't really mention on YouTube, um, the, in, the uh, infamous H-word. However, when you study history, especially difficult subjects like World War II, you always have to keep in mind that, yeah, there's the perspective that you know, but there's always at least one other side to that story. More often than not, there are multiple sides to that story. So to be objective, or as objective as you possibly can anyway with this stuff, uh, you have to understand, not agree with, but you have to understand or try to understand the other side. So it's in that attempt to understand that this book, Japan 1941, Countdown to Infamy, comes into play, and it comes into play for the following reasons. So, unless you look at specialized uh, literature, the kind of stuff you would find on, like, a PhD comp list, unless you look at that stuff, usually, not always, but usually, the way Imperial Japan's government is presented in popular memory, okay, is as one of two things. Thing number one, uh, this is a state with a Showa Emperor Hirohito, has absolute dictatorial control over his country um, and where he steers it into war. These kind of pseudo-historical books like um, David Bergamini's Japan's Imperial Conspiracy make this argument, even though there's no real evidence to back that up. Uh, and the other way this is usually presented is as a state where Hirohito doesn't actually have that much control. He has power, but not tons of it. Um, he doesn't have that much sway, and where the government is taken over by a clique of militarists, right, Tojo and these other uh, infamous people, and they steer the country into war. Democracy, it's not done away with, uh, but it kind of gets hijacked. Specialists on this period, like uh, Louise Young, who I've mentioned before, uh, or Hota, 
recognize that that situation is far more complex than, you know, basically what I just outlined. You can't oversimplify this, and you can't do that because of the way the Meiji Constitution is constructed, and thus how the Japanese government is constructed. There's not necessarily any one figure in charge. So, this book uh, is broken into 16 chapters, and Japan 1941 actually does an extremely good job, it's the best one I've found so far, it does a very good job of laying out the complexities of Japanese power structures, both in the government um, and in society at large, and it does so without really attempting to simplify the situation. This book takes you through the year of 1941, you know, as the title implies here, and it's approximately a 300-page play-by-play of what happens politically, diplomatically, internally, and externally as Japan's leaders fight with one another, misread situations, and gradually feel themselves to be backed up into a corner um, where Pearl Harbor ends up being the only recourse. Now, that being said, usually I have three categories of rank, uh, which I usually assign books that I review on this channel. Rank number one is for, you know, basic introductory material, two is for a thesis-driven work, and then, then three is for a dense monograph, uh, which requires at least some level of background knowledge, and Japan 1941 is absolutely a three. Actually, I'd maybe go further and say it's a 3.5 or a four. So, because this is basically a day-by-day, month-by-month account, uh, Japan 1941 assumes a working knowledge of the Japanese colonial empire on the part of the reader, and although it takes its time to dissect the contradictions and issues present in the Japanese government, um, it does so assuming a background knowledge of all the key people, all the important places, both, you know, in terms of where the politics are done, and geographically. It talks about Manchukuo, Harbin, Korea, uh, the city of Seoul. It assumes that you know where these places are and who these people are. It drops a lot of names at you really, really, really quickly, right? Boom, 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 very fast. Um, and it tends to repeat itself, but that's not due to unclear writing. The book repeats itself, and it delves into all kinds of uh, minutia, because the leaders of Japan deal with this ever-growing set of problems as this year, 1941, uh, you know, grinds on into the dark depths of Pearl Harbor. So, what's this book's argument for why Japan goes to war in 1941? Well, this is where we start getting into issues of blame, um, and where it's very easy for things like popular memory or, you know, lack of detailed knowledge to enable you to kind of just demonize someone or a group of people and just point the finger. This is why the book goes into so much minutia, because it's not that simple. The Japanese government is remarkably complex, to the point where it's basically irritating. So, part of that explanation is cultural, right? The great, or one of the great stereotypes about Japanese people, even today, but especially back then, is that um, Japanese people have multiple faces, right? They have the one face they uh, show to the world, and they have the one face that they keep to themselves, and there's another face you maybe show to intimate friends. But none of these three faces ever really interact. One Japanese person has three distinct personalities, and therefore what you say and what you believe um, can possibly be two very different things. And the other part of that explanation, okay, is a deeper examination of how the Japanese government actually functions. So, um, on a broad, I guess, overarching level. Yeah, the division of power is kind of weird. Uh, you have the emperor who, once the Meiji Constitution is drafted and set up, he's supposed to be the center of the government, but, like, not really. He's set off to the side. Uh, there's a parliament, which was supposed to resemble a democratic parliament, but where the people's voices weren't necessarily supposed to matter, at least not initially. Of course, during the 20s, with the rise of what's called the Taisho democracy, that changes. So what do you do now? And then, on top of that, um, work into the very structure of the Meiji government. If the military doesn't agree with something, they have the possibility to kind of withdraw their support from the government and make it collapse. And the same goes with the emperor. If the emperor doesn't agree with something, well, then a few words can create a crisis of confidence, 
and damage the government. So there's not necessarily one clear power structure here, it's all over the place. However, there's a deeper level to this. At the lower levels of government, um, the so-called young officers, uh, captains, colonels, lieutenants, those guys. So not the generals, but like not the privates either, the uh, mid-ranking people. These guys are oftentimes mid-twenties, early thirties, hence the young officers. Uh, they're often recruited from the countryside, places where during the 1920s, and then especially into the uh, Great Depression, into the early 30s, places where there was famine, where they're seeing, you know, their families basically becoming destitute, they're seeing their sisters uh, being forced to sell themselves into prostitution to survive, these people are becoming highly radicalized, and, it, and in the process of being radicalized, they're becoming extremely nationalistic, uh, they're becoming ex extremely fearful of communism, extremely fearful and resentful of um, Western imperialism, especially once stuff like the Washington Treaty starts to begin to be passed, and they often just start border clashes and border wars to which the government felt it needed to lend support, otherwise they'd lose face, and then maybe the military would withdraw support from the government, and then the government would collapse. The leadership understood across the board very clearly that any war with the U.S. would be uh, devastating. There's no way they could really win it unless they conquered China first and maybe had those resources, but even then, not really. And it would potentially lead to the destruction of Japan. So then, how do we explain this? If everybody knew it was going to be so bad, why does Japan kind of uh, bungle its way into Pearl Harbor? Well, the argument that this book makes is that, and I think it's convincing, uh, this is basically a worst-case scenario. You have young officers operating a policy of what's called get Koku Joe. This is something that it's not really clear how official this thing was, but the general idea is it's a term that means something like the low oppresses the high or the low overcomes the high. It depends how you translate it. Basically what that means is that uh, lower ranking officers are going over the heads of their superiors, they're being insubordinate, and they are um, launching unofficial border clashes and expansionist conflicts like the uh, Manchurian incident, the Norman Han incident, various military incursions into China, what um, Louise Young, a specialist on the Japanese colonial empire, calls go-fast imperialism. This basically pisses off the U.S., and it creates tension between the U.S. and Japan. And there had been tension already before this, going back into the 1800s, um, because as books like uh, William Lefebvre's The Clash make very clear over... Um, you know, the situation of Hawaii in the Pacific, Japanese expansionism, the open-door policy in China, etc. So, basically, once Japan gets into the mess, sucked into the quagmire that is the Second Sino-Japanese War, and they find they can't get out, they keep getting sucked in, and the Chinese just aren't capitulating, the Japanese aren't winning, uh, well, to win that war, you need a lot of resources. Well, the U.S. had begun to cut off resources. So what do you do? You enact what's called the uh, Strike South policy, Nanshinran. You go take out the European colonies in French Indochina. You try to go into British India. You definitely take out um, the Dutch colonies in Southeast Asia to get the oil, the rubber, the aluminum, etc. that you need to fund this war effort in China, so that maybe if you can break China, and you can consolidate the Greater East Asia co-prosperity sphere, Japan's empire, maybe then you have a fighting chance of, I don't know, tackling communism, going to actually fight the Soviet Union. The only reason the Japanese signed this non-aggression pact with the Soviets was because they knew they were militarily not weak, but not strong enough to fight a war against the USSR at the same time as they were fighting against China. So this is kind of a worst-case scenario. Of course, it didn't have to come to war. Many Japanese hoped it wouldn't, and many, for example, were hopeful that there'd be some kind of a diplomatic solution um, with FDR's government. The problem, though, is that on November 26th, 1941, FDR's Secretary of State, Cordell Hull, sends to the Japanese government in Tokyo what becomes known as the uh, Hull Note or the Hull Declaration. So a few days before that, 
the Japanese government proposed to the Americans two courses of action to avoid war. Proposal A was the end of the Sino-Japanese War, I mean, to the extent that you could do that somehow, um, and then partially withdrawing troops from Southeast Asia. If that failed, which it did, uh, they had Proposal B, and that basically is, well, if, if the U.S. cuts off support to the Chinese, Japan will withdraw a portion of its troops from Southeast Asia, and the U.S. will help supply Japan with oil. It appears that the U.S. government was going to slightly alter these terms, but they get wind of some further troop movements in the Southeast Asia, um, and then they drop counterproposals. Neither party really wanted war. The Americans and the Japanese don't want to fight each other at this point. Yeah, there were some warmongers, um, but the governments realize they have enough on their plates. America's still in depression, and Japan is trying to swallow China, and it's not working. So when the whole note comes in, basically it advocates um, and it's restating what the U.S. had wanted all along. Total troop withdrawal from China and Southeast Asia, um, and the establishment of non-aggression pacts with basically what become the Allied powers, so the U.S., Great Britain, etc., as a way to neutralize and counter the Berlin-Tokyo-Rome axis. Many Japanese leaders, though, and it wasn't intended to be this, but many of them um, at this point feel that they're backed into a corner, they feel that they have way too much on their plate, and they just, they're overwhelmed, they don't know what to do. So a lot of them, including Tojo, um, whose daughter even recounted in her diaries and in, you know, post-war interviews that once the whole note came in, she noticed, like, this physical change in her father. Tojo went from being this, this, um, upright, not boisterous, but extremely confident dude to being this, like, beaten-down old man. They take this to be an ultimatum. The problem is that by now Japan had bitten off way more than it could chew, and it's in a situation that it can't quite reasonably get out of. And the only option then, you know, if war is to happen, would be to strike the American Navy so hard and so fast as to buy Japan breathing space and time to fortify its position in the Pacific. So on December 7th, 1941, the Japanese Navy attacks Pearl Harbor, bringing the U.S. into war with Japan. And then a few days later, Nazi Germany declares war on the United States, escalating the war in Europe and the Greater East Asian War, as this was known in Japan and even today in many countries in East and Southeast Asia, it escalates these two separate conflicts, or nominally separate conflicts anyway, into what becomes known as the Second World War. This is the moment when this thing becomes global. And this was, as Erihota makes clear in her book, the fault of no one individual. To place blame like that, oh, it's Tojo, or it's Hirohito, or it's uh, Matsuoka, the Japanese um, diplomat and, you know, foreign minister, or it's uh, Oshima Hiroshi, this um, diplomat and attaché to uh, Nazi Germany. To place the blame at the hands of any one of these guys is to misunderstand the situation that the Japanese government found itself in and to misunderstand the inability of the Japanese government to control its military. So the book is thus uh, required reading if you, like me, are strongly interested in the Pacific War or the Japanese colonial empire, or perhaps more importantly, if you're interested in how and why nations go to war and how even the smallest of circumstances, no matter what it is, can grow into something unimaginable given time. So that's it for this video, guys. I hope you all enjoyed. Um, I hope you'll consider picking this up, and, you know, until the next video, take care, and I'll see you all next time.